here's the problem. The word, the word emunah we translate as faith. Faith or belief. And the problem is that that word means something that you cannot know. That's what it means. The English word belief means something blind. It means a leap of faith, blind belief, blind faith, something that cannot be known. That's what the word means. The fact that you're sitting in front of me is something I know. It's not something that's appropriate to call belief. What's on the other side of this wall? We have to talk about belief. I don't have direct experience of that. So the word faith means something that is not known. And the, the fundamental question to ask is, is the object of our emunah, of our, let's call it faith, is it something that can be known or not? And if you bring it right down to the most basic question of all, it is the question about God's existence. Does Hashem exist or not? That's a legitimate question. All our commentaries are not afraid to deal with that directly. And that is the place to begin. The question is, can you know that Hashem exists or can you not? If you can know it, we should talk, we should talk about knowledge. If you cannot know it, why should I believe it? Is the question clear? Anyone? If this is something that can be known, then we should talk about the pathway to getting the knowledge. It's true you might not start knowing it, but any field of, of inquiries like that, any professional field, you might start out taking it on some sort of faith until you get a professional knowledge, but we don't call it belief. When I began studies as a medical student, the first time I was introduced to actual clinical studies, so they took me into a ward, a patient was sitting on the bed, and they said, put this thing in your ears, and listen to his heart. So I did that, and I put it on his chest, I couldn't hear the heart, could not hear a heart. I heard my fingers creaking, I heard the buses going by in the street, I couldn't hear the heart, I thought, I'm going to be a doctor, I can't even if he's got a heart. But as the years go by, and you pick up experience, you begin to, you begin to gain the knowledge. If I do that today, I can hear that heart perfectly, in fact, I don't hear anything else. I can picture the valves, I can see exactly. That's professional, professional experience. And many fields are like that. So even though you may not start off knowing, the, knowing or having the knowledge, you move towards it and you call it knowledge. So if there's a program of study, of investigation, that can take you to knowing that Hashem exists, then we should talk about knowledge. If we have to talk about belief, it means something we can't know. And then the problematic, the real problem is, why should I commit myself to something that cannot be known? If it's some sort of a blind leap, why should I do that? Why should I commit my life and maybe have to die one day for something that cannot be known? So um, that's the question. That's the question. Now, let's put this in context because we live in a Western ethos where faith is exactly something that is blindly believed. The Christian, the, the Muslim world has a different issue here. If we get time, we'll talk about that. But the Christian context that we find ourselves in, that world defines faith ex exactly as something that's a personal belief, a personal commitment. There's some sort of a leap of faith. There's a personal commitment. And logic is not the issue. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Some time ago, I was flying from London to South Africa, a long overnight flight. And sitting next to me is a man who tells me that he's an Episcopalian charismatic preacher. Don't ask me what it is, but definitely Christian. Okay. And he spent the flight trying to convert me to Christianity. <coughs> okay. About 2.30 in the morning, he tried to show me that the founder of Christianity could fulfill the requirements for being the Messiah. He could be the Mashiach. Why? Because one of the critical characteristics that he needs is that he's descended from the house of David. So he showed me at great, great, took great pains to show me that according to all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his father Joseph, the carpenter in Bethlehem, the father, right, of J.C., who founded Christianity, his father was descended from Yehuda, from Judah, through David, and therefore fulfills the requirements for being the Mashiach, because we know the Mashiach must be Ben David. Very, very careful to show, although the discrepancies in the genealogy, but definitely goes back to there. So that Joseph, the father of this man, is descended from the house of David, and therefore he could be the Mashiach. So when he got through explaining that to me, I said to him, but you as a Christian, surely you believe that his father had nothing to do with his birth? I mean, uh, problem? So he said to me, what does logic have to do with religion? He wasn't being facetious. He told me I was confused. He told me that I was confused to look for logical evidence for a story that is a story of faith. On the contrary, he gave me to understand that the more illogical it is, the greater the act of faith. Right? That's the approach. That's the approach. The approach is that there's a personal commitment here. It's not based on rigorous verification. Another way you can see this is that if you look at the um, extremely popular modern subject of debating Torah and science or religion and science, you'll see that almost always the protagonists in that debate are extremely well qualified scientifically and almost ha never have any religious knowledge at all. Time magazine, for example, a couple of years ago, they ran a debate between Richard Dawkins, who's a violently atheistic 
biologist, and Francis Collins, who's I think a Nobel Prize winning geneticist. These two men are exquisitely highly qualified biologically, scientifically. Neither of them has any training in religion. Right? Their, their technical knowledge of religion is, is less than childish. How do you debate a subject at the highest intellectual level where you have no training or, or, or technical rigorous background? The idea is that in Christianity it's just a feeling. Right? It doesn't need rigorous logical verification. <coughs> On the contrary, it's a different category. In England where I live now, it's considered impolite to argue about religion. How dare you argue with somebody else? He's got, he's got a right to his beliefs and you have a right to yours. Which means that if two people believe two mutually exclusive things, that's fine, that's cool. You have a right to believe what you want, you have a right to believe what he wants. There's no requirement that there be objectivity or verification of fact. There's a personal feeling. One, one very nice way to see this is that here in Yushalayim a few years ago, they had a debate between science and religion. And the scientific speakers were world famous uh, experts in science. And the religious position was taken by Rabbi Refson, who's a, an Englishman with a very dry sense of humor. And this is how the debate went. The first speaker was a world-famous astrophysicist, unfortunately Jewish, whose great-grandfather wrote a Talmudic dictionary. But he's very assimilated, very assimilated individual. And he argued the atheistic position. And he began his debate like this. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know much about religion. First of all, can you imagine beginning a debate that way? You've been invited to Yerushalayim to speak at an international level on a subject, and your opening statement is you actually don't know anything about the subject. In which field would that be acceptable? But anyway, he began like this. I don't know much about religion, but I think it can be summed up as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And on the basis of that assumption, he gave his talk. Rabbi Refson was the second speaker. He got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know much about astrophysics, but I think it can be summed up as twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> You know, if you're going to debate a subject and talk about it, you ought to know it. But when it comes to religion, that's not a requirement. That's very telling and very important to understand. In Jewish thinking, that's ridiculous. Right? In our, in our, to our way of looking at the world, the subject doesn't begin unless it's rigorously verified and stands on very strong evidence. So let's try to define a Jewish approach to this subject. And I think it goes like this. We claim that you can know that Hashem exists. And then all the spin-off concepts that come from that giving of the Torah, uniqueness of the Jewish people, all of those things. But it begins with knowledge that Hashem exists. And our claim is that you can know that. In fact, you ought to. The Rambam says the mitzvah is to know God. That's our claim. And that leaves us with two questions. One is, how do you get the knowledge? If our claim is that you can know that Hashem exists, then the first question is, how do you get the knowledge? And the second is, the second is, why call it faith? Why call it emunah if that means blind relationship? That's not in the category of knowledge. Right? Those are the two questions. I'd like to spend more time on the second one today, but just to suggest some <coughs> beginning of an approach to the first one, although we don't have time to work it out fully, I would say this, that if you're asked formally, and there's much more to the subject than this, but if you're asked for a formal definition of how we know that Hashem exists, what are the formal pillars of Jewish wisdom, Torah? There are two. One is that we met him personally. We met him personally at Sinai. And that has a subsection, which is obviously, how can I rely on the story of that, the transmission of that story, since I wasn't there personally. But the first pillar of knowledge is that we have a personal experience of God. And the second is scientific philosophical investigation of the world around us. And that's a legitimate approach. Many non-Jews have done that as well. Classic Jewish sources do that too. And that's a second approach, but second in importance. The first pillar, that is, we Hashem, we met God personally at Sinai. This, this you need, if you want to take the subject further, you need to look it up and research it. The classic source on this is the Kuzari, who actually approaches it on a logical basis. He tries to disprove it and see how the attacks stand up. And that's, without doubt, a classic, a classic source. But just to, just to point a direction, I mentioned just one fact about Sinai which is unique. Do you know that the claim that we met Hashem, we met God personally, is the only time in the history of mankind, in the East and the West, that anybody has ever claimed that God spoke to a person with more than one witness present. That means no witnesses at all. If you go through all the claims of all the religions of the world and all the sects and cults, ancient and modern, there's never been a claim besides ours that Hashem manifested to a person with even one witness present. And for sure there are liars out there. There's no question, right? There's plenty of liars out there. <laughs> and no one's even had the chutzpah to fake a witness. No, this is a verse in the Torah. The Torah says, has there ever been a case of Hashem taking one nation out of another as I took you out of Egypt? And it depends an amazing statement. It says, oh, 
which means has there ever been purported to be such a thing? And that statement made 3,326 years ago is still valid. Nobody has even purported to have a witness. Remarkable thing. I'm not talking about miracles. I'm not talking about manipulations of nature. I've seen witch doctors in South Africa do things that are physically impossible with my own eyes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a claim of God speaking to you. Christianity begins with Paul's famous vision on the Damascus Road. Paul of Tarsus, right? The Jew, Saul. He came back and he told the Jews that God had spoken to him. And they said, and who witnessed this with you? And he said, no, it was personal, private revelation. Not good enough for us. Muhammad came out of his tent. Allah spoke to me and here's the Quran. And who witnessed this revelation? Private. Not good enough for us. You can go, away. You can go to Utah. Utah. In 1880, a fellow woke up, Joseph Smith, and he said God spoke. And hundreds of thousands of people follow that. Not on the testimony of one individual with no corroboration. We are the only incident, the amazing claim. We claim that millions of people, 3.6 million Jews, 7.2 million if you include the Egyptian converts, millions of people who witnessed the same thing. It's a remarkable claim. But I think more relevant is what bothers the most, I think, modern people more, is how can you, tr how can you trust the story? You're talking about a story transmitted through innumerable generations through the mists of time. There's no way it could be accurate. If I whisper something in your ear, and you whisper it in his, and you whisper it in his, by the time it gets around to you, you have nothing to do with the original story. You can show that easily. So how can, we trans how can we trust the story that's been transmitted through countless tellings? Is there any way that it could be accurate? The usual way this claim is made by the anti-Semitic sources on this. They say, you know, it was probably a band of nomads, some, some Arabs, Abrahamic family in the desert, you know, probably smoking something very good. They're having, uh, you know, experiences. And that sort of uh, hallucinogenic, you know, that type of experience was embellished over time. And today it's the Torah. That's the claim. The claim is it was probably some sort of charismatic experience, very small, and it got amplified and embellished. That's a ridiculous claim. And when someone makes that claim, you need to know how to answer it. And the answer is this. First of all, do you know that if you call, let's take a round number and call Sinai 3,200 years ago, and if you call a generation 40 years, which is enough time for people to tell their children and even people to tell their grandchildren, which is a mitzvah, 40 divides into 3,200, how many times? Only 80. We're only talking about 80 generations, and we know exactly who they were. The Rambam in his introduction to the Mishnah lists the lead of every single generation from Sinai to his day. Not only do we know who they were, we have the original writings in every case. And in most of those cases, we have the original parchment. For example, if you go, to, if you go right here in Yushalayim, you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are at least 2,000 years old. There's a fragment of every book of the Torah there except for the Megillah of Esther. Right? Amazing thing. Rabbi Becher told me that he took his children there and his 10-year-old climbed up on a box and he looked into a glass case and he started reading a scroll of Isaiah that's 2,100 years old. He said, Abba, we learned this 10 days in school. Rabbi Becher said the real miracle is that the kid remembers what he learned 10 days ago in school. <laughs> but here's a child in the modern era reading a scroll of Yeshaya that's exactly a parchment, not just the same copied text. The same, right? You know, I have an amazing, uh, I live in England now. A few months ago, I had the amazing <coughs> privilege of going in to see the Cairo Gniza. Do you know about this amazing, amazing thing? Do you know, in 1896 in Fostat in Cairo, they were redecorating the shul. And the fellow plastering the wall found a soft spot and he found himself in a room that hadn't been open for, for a long, long time. And in this room, they found 200,000 documents that the community had been keeping for 1,600 years. You're talking about pieces of Sifrei Torah. You're talking about Sidurim. You're talking about Ksubis. You're talking about Hecherim on cheese given to Karaite. Uh, unbelievable things. I held in my own hands a piece of a Sefer Torah written in the year 600. 600, before Islam became a religion. You, unbelievable thing. You're talking about there's business letters of Rav Yosef Karo there with his signature. There's letters of the Arizal. There are 400 Ksubas. There's, there's a Heksher on cheese given to a Karaite manufacturer in Cairo just before the Rambam ar ar arrived. And they made him swear, the rabbis in Cairo made him swear on a Sefer Torah because, you know, the Karaites didn't accept anything later. Right? And the Rambam put a stop to that. You see that stops immediately the, the, the time that he arrives. Unbelievable thing. I held in my hands a Siddur of a child written in the year 11, 1150. It's the only thing in color, by the way. The, all is the, the rest is regular parchment. This is a beautiful colored Siddur. And on the first page, the child has practiced Aleph, 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 base, base, base. And then he's a little picture of himself on his camel. You're talking about documents you can hold in your hands so going back to the year 600, which are exactly... You're talking about a chain of transmission where we can pinpoint every step and we have complete corroboration. Do you know that the difference between an Ashkenazi and, and Sephardi Sefer Torah is one letter? 
the, the, the word Dakai is it's spelled with Aleph with a Hay. It's not bad for 3,200 years. So you're talking about Jews all over the world sitting down to a Pesach Seder, telling their children, that, first of all, can you imagine all Jews agreeing? If that isn't miraculous, I don't want that. Sinai has nothing compared to that. You're talking about Jews in Tunis and Yemen and Poland telling their children exactly the same story in exactly the same words. Unbelievable corroboration. By the way, I saw a Haggadah there from the year 900 and something. The, their, their Haggadah has five questions. The Haggadah has five questions. It also has a fifth question. How come we don't eat roasted meat on this night? Same Haggadah as we have. Their fifth question as well, corresponding to the five cups. Anyway. So you're talking about a chain of transmission that has unbelievable corroboration. And therefore, we to we're talking about a completely different order of transmission and verification among a people who are naturally extremely skeptical. But that's a subject for investigation that needs to be done. And there's also philosophical investigation, which we don't have time to go into now either. Perhaps just point out one detail there is that most of the arguments that are brought from science and philosophy the pattern of argument like the argument from design, for example. It's very important to know that all of those arguments are second rate in terms of our evidence. And one of the reasons is that they're all negative. They're all um, exclusion. They're all arguments by exclusion, right? For example, the argument from design. The argument from design says that a complex structure such as the universe could not have come about by accident. In other words, you can impugn the notion right, that it's accidental. You can't prove God directly. You can prove that the alternative is, is problematic, which is, you know, in mathematics, you can either prove a thing by derivation, which means you build it up from first principles, or you can have two options and prove that one is impossible. So by exclusion, you prove the other. They're both rigorously accurate and, and, and reliable, but the difference is this. When you prove a thing by derivation, you end up understanding it. When you prove a thing by exclusion, you end up proving that the opposite is true and no idea what it is. All you know is that the alternative don't, right? And if there's a leap of faith, perhaps, perhaps that, that's where we should begin thinking about it. But be that as it may, we claim that it's a rigorous study that is necessary. One needs to investigate this. And our claim is that this ought to be a knowledge and not a belief. By the way, it's critical to understand that when we talk about knowledge, we do not mean absolute knowledge. We do not claim that you can know that Hashem exists. Absolutely. That's very important to know that. And the reason is because the human mind is not capable of absolute knowledge. It's not because the evidence is weak. It's because you can never know anything absolutely. All you can ever have is good enough evidence. You can never have knowledge. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. Let me ask you a question. Are you awake right now? I mean, those of you who are. Are you awake right now? Yes. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. Are you absolutely sure? No. You might be back in your room dreaming, sleeping, dreaming that you're listening to a wonderful talk <laughs> on the subject of Imuna, and you think you're awake. When you dream, you think you're awake. That's why you can go through ecstasy in a dream or abject terror. If you knew it was a dream, you wouldn't be terrified, right? So you can't even know you're awake. The famous philosopher Russell proved that you can't even prove that the world is more than five minutes old. Maybe the world popped into existence five minutes ago with all your memories in place. I mean, these things shouldn't bother you. If they bother you seriously, you, you know, you need therapy. But, uh, you know, <laughs> the point is that from a formal point of view, rigorous, analytical, philosophical point of view, you can never know anything absolutely. All you can ever ask for is good enough evidence. Right? And important things, life, life and death things, like, like flying on a plane, you trust a pilot, you trust a surgeon, you do something really dangerous, like get married. I mean, whatever it is, <laughs> you never have absolute knowledge. Somebody who says, Rabbi, I accept 95% evidence in the rest of my life, but in religion I want 100%, I cannot deliver the goods. I can't satisfy that request. If the person asks me for evidence as compelling as other areas, I can begin to deal with it. By the way, the Ramban says, that the evidence we have in religion is not as good as it is in mathematics and engineering. He says that openly in his introduction to the work on the Balamor. So when it comes to theological knowledge, we're talking about a knowledge that is called compelling evidence. And an honest person will predicate his actions on evidence as compelling as he predicates other actions. That's an honest person we can deal with. Him. But a person who wants 100% and he knows that his mind is not capable of 100 in other areas, that, that we can't do. And therefore, we're talking here about a working knowledge. And by the way, for those of you involved in outreach, I think it's a serious mistake when people advertise, come to my seminar, you know, my outreach seminar. You walk in on Friday afternoon as a, as a, as a skeptical, cynical atheist, and you walk out Sunday night as a fanatic, extreme, right-wing person blow-drying his payers. You know, I think that's a mistake because I think pe when people advertise proof and they don't deliver, they leave people worse off than they were before. I don't think we should be advertising proof. We should be advertising compelling evidence, right? Our evidence is excellent, amazing. But to advertise proof and then leave a person walk out feeling it wasn't completely proved, I think there's a, mis a mistaken agenda, and I don't think it I don't think does anyone any good personally. 
So part one, we claim that Hashem's knowledge can be known. And there's an agenda of work that needs to be done to get to that knowledge. But I'd like to spend the time we have this morning on something else. And that is, why do we call it faith? And this requires concentration. Because this is not familiar territory. If our approach is based on rigorous study and coming to know, in a way where the evidence is as good as other fields of human inquiry, then why do we call this faith? And the answer is this. The word emunah is not translated as faith. We translate it as faith because we, we live in a Christian world. So our language is, is, is redolent with the values of a culture. Language isn't only a way of communication. It's also a, a, something that steeps you in a culture. And so when we say faith, when we translate emunah as faith, we do like the King James Bible. So we have in our heads a Christian kind of a faith. That's a wrong translation. Here's the right translation. This will take you much further. The word emunah should be translated not as faith, but as faithfulness. It doesn't mean faith. It means loyalty. Emunah means ne'eman, to be loyal. It means to know something and then be loyal to the knowledge. First of all, textually. Textually. When you get time, go through the text of Tanakh and find the times when the Torah used the word emunah and see honestly how it can be translated. Moses is holding his hands up, right? Moshe Rabbeinu holding his hands up in the battle against Amalek. As long as his hands are, in the, are up, we win the battle. When his hands sink, we lose the battle. And the Torah says, Vahayu yadav emunah. At Bahashamish. His hands were emunah till the sun went down. His hands were faith. It's impossible to translate that way. His hands were faithful. They stayed put. Emunah means a tenacious loyalty, an attachment to duty that doesn't move. It doesn't mean blind belief. What's that worth? Hashem is speaking to Avram. And during the conversation it says, Vehemin Bashem. And the King James Bible says it means, and he believed in God. Abraham believed in God. A prophet doesn't believe in God. He knows. He's speaking to him. It means he was loyal to this God, even when asked to kill his own child. We're not talking about blind belief. The major says that when God created the world, the major says, He'emin ba'olamoi ubra'oi. God believed in his world and created it. God believed in his world. That means he believed. It means he was loyal to the project. There was an aspiration and a definition of destination, and he did it all the way through. Emunah means to be an eman. It means to be loyal. It doesn't mean blind belief. Let's think about this. How does this work? That means you get a knowledge, and then there's a loyalty to the knowledge that's required. But why? What fool would see a direction clearly, see all the evidence, and have it as clear as it gets in the human, human capacity, and then completely ignore it and walk in the opposite direction, completely betraying the truth that he knows? Who would do that? What fool would do a thing like that? And the answer is you, with all due respect. Because we are built in that way. We are built in such a way that you can know a thing clearly and completely betray it and walk in opposite direction. The Greeks in classical Greek thinking, they called this the problem of akrasia. Akrasia means the gap between the head and heart. Right? In old philosophical language, it was called incontinence. It means inability to hold the project all the way through. There's a gap between the head and the heart. It's a fundamental thing to understand. <laughs> there's first of all the head that needs to gain clarity. And there's a second work of character that needs to take that, that clarity all the way through into action. And it's a completely separate agenda. We built in such a way that we can see a thing clearly and completely. I'll give you an example. I see a lot of dubious faces. Ever tried dieting? Here's how a diet works. On the one hand, there's your clarity, right? You see the direction, see how you have to go, self-image, next summer on the Frum Beach, you know, like uh, self-respect, relationships, like clear. And you know exactly what you have to do, and if you do it, you'll get there. Would you call that a clear vision? It's clear, strong motivation, clear vision? And on the other hand, there's this little chocolate wedge thing with a bit of cream and a cherry, which represents 10 seconds of pleasure, during which you'll feel like an idiot. <laughs> and a minute later, you're looking at a plate that is licked <coughs> clean. There's not even a lick of chocolate. How did that happen? How did that happen? You had an agenda. You had a clarity. You knew exactly what you had to do. The alternative was absolutely, pathetically, ridiculously childish. How did you fall for that? You know, when I was a, a junior intern in surgery, one of the first patients I ever had in the hospital where I was working was a patient with Burgers disease. This disease is an exquisite sensitivity to nicotine in cigarette smoke. People who have this disease, if they smoke, their blood vessels close down. First their fingers fall off, <coughs> then their hands fall off, and there are multiple amputations. There's not one recorded case in a non-smoker. This man was a 45-year-old highly intelligent engineer. He was smoking. He came into our ward because his leg was blue. The main artery supplying his leg had been closed. He had four black toes we had to cut off that day. And this man knew that if he carried on smoking, we have to cut his leg off. 
He knew more about the disease than we did. You know, so the man carried on smoking, and three weeks later, we were forced to do an above-knee amputation. The next time I saw him, I was a senior intern in surgery, and I remember seeing him being wheeled down the hospital corridor in a wheelchair with no legs, smoking, on his way to losing an arm. By the way, when I mentioned this to a, a colleague in New York, he told me he's got a friend who's a vascular surgeon. He had a patient like this. When he lost his second arm, he had them rig up some wire on the wheelchair so he could carry on smoking. <gasps> but so you're talking about, so, this stands here with a, let's get the thinking clear. Leg, cigarette. Hmm, cigarette, leg. Throw away the cigarette, leg, live, man, husband, father, walk, leg. Or 30 seconds of pleasure during which you'll feel the cold hand of death. How could you get that wrong? How could you get that wrong? And the answer is it's a long way from here to here or here, wherever the problem is. There are two efforts of character that are required. One is tenacious attachment to the study program to get it clear. <laughs> Clarification, verification, corroboration, examination of evidence. <coughs> but that's not enough. Once it's clear, there's no guarantee it will come down into action. The organs of action have their own agenda. You know, the Zohar says, amazing thing, the Zohar says that there are two departments to truth and faith. The Zohar says this thing here, truth, is called male, and this thing, faith, is called female. And only together, with the marriage of the two, are you integrated human being. The Zohar puts this whole clumsy discussion that I'm trying to go through with you in four words. The Zohar says, e hu emes, the e he emuna. He is truth, and she is faith. What does that mean? It means this. There's a male effort of clarification. By the way, this is traditionally why men study Talmud. The object, the reason you study Talmud is to gain clear thinking. You do not learn Gemara to learn the outcomes. You want the output, the outcome, you look in the code of Jewish law. The Gemara is there to teach you how to think clearly. By the way, the Gemara is there to teach you how to not think unclearly. The Gemara doesn't present things clearly. The Gemara presents the wrong things and shows you how to see through them. The Gemara doesn't give you, the Gemara gives you Havaminas, what you would think, and then it shows you where it's wrong. Teachers do not accept the, the world at face value. And then when you've punched through to a new level of clarity, don't accept that either. It's that rigorous training and stripping away the facade from reality. But once you've done that, that male work, there's a second work that's required. A and probably it's the more difficult work. And that's bringing it down to the action. And that's a female work. How does, this, how does this operate? There are many ways to show this. I mean, the model, of course, according to Kabbalistic sources, the model is that when a child is conceived, there's male and female components. And you see it clearly. The male component is instantaneous. The male component involves no tenacious attachment to anything. There's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no... The male component is giving half a genetic code, that's all. That's all that's required. The rest is all female, day after day of a pregnancy, ending in difficulty and danger and pain and risk and crisis. And all of that is the female. When you hold a newborn child in your hands, it's all come from the mother. There's nothing there from the father. The father's contribution is a theoretical half a gene, that's all. The entire body of the child is built by the mother. Right? And there's two completely opposite poles. There's the male, which is an explosion of potential. You know, I'll never forget the incredible experience of having to dissect a human embryo. You know that, you know that the organs that form seed come from the kidneys. A piece of the kidney breaks off and starts moving down in the body. Right? And in the male, they become organs that form seed by the billion. And the same tissue in the female becomes organs that form eggs one at a time, and you can count every one. Now, a woman ovulates every month of her fertile years. She'll use every single last one. And when male meets female, you're talking about an explosion of billions meeting one only. The beauty of the male is un endless energy. The curse of the male is only potential. The curse of the beauty of the female, something's real and alive in the world. The curse of the female, only this one. All the rest has died. Complete opposite poles, nothing in common at all. Maleness, a point of origin. No hard work required at all. No staying power at all. Energy, potential. And female is the long road of the work that's done with all the pain and difficulty. That tenacious attachment to a project that takes it all the way through to fulfillment. That's the female. You know, the, it's an amazing source on this. You know, the Aruch. The Aruch is an old Talmudic dictionary. Rashi quotes it. The Aruch puts it like this. You should look this up. The Maharal has a fantastic analysis of this Aruch. Very straightforward, simple Hebrew. And he says this. We won't have time today to go through it fully, but just to point the direction. The Aruch puts it like this. It's an incredible source. Look it up in the Siva Imuna. The Aruch says there was a young woman who went to visit her father. She dressed in her finest and she was wearing her jewelry. Every detail here is critical, but 
just the general gist of this. This is called the story of the Bor and the Khulda. The Bor and the Khulda. The Bor is a pit in the ground, and the Khulda is a wild ferret or a wild cat or a weasel, some sort of dangerous small. And by the way, the Kabbalists say that the Bor and the Khulda are female and male also. But without getting into that, this girl was going to visit her father, and on her journey to see her father, she strayed into a wilderness. And in that desert, she got lost, and she accidentally fell into a bore. And she was at the bottom of this pit. She couldn't climb out. She certainly would have died there. But as she cried, it so happened that a young man was walking there, and he heard her cries. He walked over to the pit, and he looked down. He saw a woman. He said, who are you? She said her name. She was a Jewish girl. He was a Jewish young man. He was a coin, in fact. He said to her, are you human? He thought maybe she was one of the twilight zone shady creatures of the desert, semi-human. She said, I'm human. He said, make an oath. Swear. How would that help, by the way? Wouldn't Elias swear that he's going to... Wouldn't Elias swear that he's telling the truth? But the dark side cannot use Hashem's name. You have to you make us sure you have to use Hashem's name. And she did. He said, fine, I believe you. Now, if I save you, will you marry me? So she said, yes. She didn't have much choice, did she? <laughs> so he lifted her out of the pit, and he wanted to consummate the marriage on the spot. See, we're talking maleness here. You understand? This is a story of male and female. So she said, that's not decent. That's not how we behave. I'll go back to my town and prepare for the wedding. You go back to your town and give me time to prepare. Then after enough time, you come and meet my parents, and then we'll get married. So the young man agreed. But before parting, they wanted to make a vote, right? A, a Jewish engagement. But to do that in Jewish law, you need witnesses. There were no witnesses. It was a wasteland. So they decided to take the only two things that were present to be their witnesses the bore into which she had fallen, and a chulda that was running past. By the way, this is a deep subject. This is, this is parallel to the Torah, where Moshe Rabbeinu makes heaven and earth, which are also male and female, and also non-human witnesses to the Jewish people. There's a lot to, lot to talk about here. But they, they, they promised each other that they would marry, and the bore and the chulda would be their witnesses. And they parted. She went back to her town and began preparing for the wedding. He went back to his town and forgot. Forgot. It's even more humiliating than that. The Aruch says, Kevan mipane, which means as soon as she was out of sight, he forgot. Sometime later, he met another woman. He got married. She became pregnant. She had a child. The child fell into a bore and died. She became pregnant again. She had a second child. The child was bitten by a chulda. And at that point, the woman turned to her husband. She said, this is bizarre. What does this mean? And then he remembered the story of the bore and the chulda. And he told her. And she said, if that's true, you divorce me. And you go back and you find the woman that you promised all those years before. You see, it's a woman who's teaching him and a woman who's waiting. The Lord says he divorced her and he made, he made his way back to the town that he remembered the girl had said she came from. And when he entered the town, he found her father. And her father said, unfortunately, you can no longer see her. She's become insane. The waiting has made her insane. People go near, she shreds their clothing. She's just completely become insane. But he begged to be allowed to see the girl. He entered the room where she was. She started shredding his clothes, insane. He said to her, Bor and Hulda, she recognized him. And then she revealed to him that she'd be pretending to be insane so that nobody else could marry her because she was waiting. The Lord says they're married, they're children, they're a happy life together. But what's being taught here? Male, female. What's the male quality? Verification. Absolute verification. Let's get it clear. Let's get it absolutely clear. I want you to swear. Instantaneous gratification. Immediate results. Staying power? Zero. Nothing. The female? Clarification, zero. No, no idea where she is. Wanders in the desert, hopelessly lost. Useless. Staying power, total. Unbelievable. You gave a word, you gave a commitment. It's got nothing to do with logic. What are the chances it's going to come back years later? That's not the issue. The issue is you, you have a commitment and you stay with it. These are two opposite poles. The first is clarification. It works only in the instant. It's absolute clarity, as absolute as it gets flash of light. And then there's the darkness. You know, the Rambam says that life is like standing on a dark plain on a stormy night. You stand there beaten by the wind, lashed by the rain, hopelessly lost. And at your moment of greatest despair, unexpectedly there's a flash of lightning. And in that flash of lightning, you see the road clearer than by day. And as you see it, the light disappears. And the rest of the night is walking through the storm on memory alone of the flash of light that you once saw. The Ramam says some people see more flashes of light, some people see less, but no one walks in the light. And these are the two poles. There's the male flash of clarity. It couldn't be clearer. And then it disappears. And then there's the female work of remaining attached, of remaining loyal, long after the evidence has become very thin indeed. 
And that's a test of character. And only an integrated marriage between the two results in a, a human being worth being. <coughs> you know that the uh <coughs> you know that when the evidence gets weaker and weaker and the process continues further and further, eventually it enters a crisis where not only is no evidence left, but the evidence is all become completely controverted, completely perverted, completely inverted. And all that's become clear is that what I committed myself to could not possibly be right. And you still have to go through that. Again, the Kabbalists showed very clearly. How does a woman give birth? The conception is no problem. And then the pregnancy continues. But finally, when she goes into labor, it looks like two people are dying. It doesn't look like birth. It doesn't look like birth. If you stepped into a room where a woman was giving birth, imagine a man, a male, who had no idea about how women give birth, steps into a room and he sees that process going on for the first time. He'd, uh, he'd probably call the police. I don't need therapy. I don't know what would happen. No and if he had to go through it himself, he'd need therapy the rest of his life. There's no question. He'd never, he'd never recover. <laughs> it looks like she's dying. But the Rambam points out that it looks like the baby's dying too. Because what the child goes through in the womb, you know, the Rambam was a doctor. You, you, see, you forgot this as well, but, <laughs> but listen to this. The Rambam says this. The child in the womb lives opposite to the way a child is born. You know that? The child in the womb has 25 different conditions that he needs to keep him alive, any of which would kill him if you gave it to him when he's born. And you have conditions keeping you alive that if you gave any of those to the fetus, you'd kill him. So a child has to be born from one situation into a complete inversion of dozens of factors. A child in the womb lives underwater. He has no air to breathe. He has holes in his heart. The blood flows in the opposite direction. He has no lungs. The child in the womb has little scrunched up nubbins of tissue. All the blood going to the lungs goes in the opposite direction through one of the biggest blood vessels in the body. He's got blood vessels coming out of his liver. He looks nothing like you. He's got a different type of blood. And all of those things keep him alive in an idyllic, idyllic way in that environment. And then birth begins. And this is about to be thrust out into another world. There's no question he's going to die. You know, there's a famous work on death and dying called the Gesher Chaim. In the third part of that work, he talks about standing at a graveside, watching someone being buried and our feelings there. And he says it's like two twins in the womb. Whereas one twin begins to be born, the remaining twin starts to mourn for his brother. No question, he, no, no way he can survive out there. He's got 10 different features in his body that are going to kill him. Little does he know that that's where life begins. That's how you should be thinking when you stand in such a moment. So this child is born, and the little kid, you know, I've done this dozens of times as a doctor. You deliver that child, you, you hold the little baby in your hands, and you watch him start to die. First the child goes blue, then he goes purple, starts to make these terrible gasping movements. He's bleeding like crazy. You know that the, the child, the newborn child, has about 300 cc's of blood, that's all. And he's bleeding furiously through the umbilical cord. There's 10 different reasons why he's going to be dead in two minutes for sure. And as you stand there helplessly, you hold this little child. First, the umbilical cord clamps down like a cord of steel. At exactly the same moment, the holes in his heart close and the blood flow reverses. The major blood vessel taking all the blood away from the lungs closes down. And the blood hits the lungs. At exactly the same moment, the lungs pop open and he takes his first breath. And about three and a half minutes later, it's all reversed and he's doing fine. That must have taken a good few orangutans in the trees over a good few million years to get right by accident. Talking about a lot of chimpanzees that must have not made it <laughs> before we got to us. <laughs> Unbelievable situation. And that's the female experience. A woman goes through that in her flesh. And by the way, that's why we're seeing Asha's Chayla on a Friday night. Because Friday night is the transition from the mundane process of the week to the redemption of Shabbos. And that's called Chevle Mashiach. Chevle Mashiach means the birth process of Mashiach. And it's a woman who experiences that. Man has no idea about that. Man is a first phase creature where it's all easy, just a blast of energy and potential. But it's the female who goes through what feels like death for two people and delivers life into the world because she's remained attached to the project. By the way, you know Chevle Mashiach? You know there's a Medrash. You know the Medrash says that before the Mashiach comes, this is an amazing Medrash, you look it up yourself. It's a Medrash called Besa Medrash, written about 2,000 years ago, 1,800 years ago. The Medrash says that before the Mashiach comes, the Arabs will have a building on the Harabais. Do you know about this? This was written four centuries before Islam became a religion. The Medrash says the Arabs will have a building on the Temple Mount. And just before the Mashiach arrives, the leaders of the Jews will go to the Arabs and say to them, remove your building, we want to build the Temple. And the Arabs will say, no, it's our holy site. There will be a moment of tension, and then the Arabs will turn to the Jews and say to them, let's not argue, let's make a divine test. We believe in God, as you hadn't noticed. Whatever He says is fine with us, even if it costs our lives. We'll build an altar, and you Jews build an altar. We put a sacrifice on, you put a sacrifice, like in the days of old Baileo. And we'll see if fire comes from heaven for which of our, but we make a deal with you. If Hashem accepts our offering, you join our religion. But if He accepts yours, we'll join and follow the Torah, and the Jews agree. 
The Medjah says the Jews build an altar they put a sacrifice on. The Arabs build an altar put a sacrifice on. And fire comes from heaven to accept the Arabs' offering. Talking about a test of faith. That a woman gives birth, doesn't look like she's having a picnic. Looks like she's dying. Looks like exact opposite. At that moment, the Arabs turn to the Jews and they say to them, we had a deal. The Jews say, never. Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekein Hashem Echad. There's a terrible battle. Those who survive flee to the desert. And after 40 days of hiding in the desert, the Mashiach Haraz. And the Medjish says he goes to Hebron, he wakes up the Avos, he leads them out of the Machpel, a very long and beautiful Medjish. I once asked Rasim Chavasim, will it be like that? And he said it will be exactly like that. Meaning, a story where all the evidence is opposite, and only you go through that bloody and difficult death-appearing experience. That's called Chavle Mashiach, where birth. And only a woman who can go through that. In Egypt, the men collapsed, the women held strong. In the desert, the men collapsed, the women held strong. At Hanukkah, it was Yehudis who began the revolt. At Purim, it was Esther. It's always a woman that goes through the crisis of character that's needed. It's the man who brings clarity, Mordechai on the outside, bringing down the message with clarity, and it's Esther doing the work in what looks like exactly the opposite of what should be. And that's the story. The story is that there's two departments. There's MS and Emona. There's the clarification, the male process. That's Torah study. That's clarification. That's learning to think objectively, rigorously, corroborating evidence, Nothing less than the best will do. But it's only half the work. After that, there's the work of bringing it down into the character and staying with it. And that's called emuna, to be ne'eman. Let me finish with a story. Here's a story, and I'll, I'll leave you to think about this. This is a true story. Now, you know, nowadays you have to tell true stories because people Google what you say. <laughs> And therefore, all my stories are true. I mean, some happened and some didn't, but they're all true. <laughs> anyway, here's a true story. Here's a true story. Hey, if this doesn't move you, there's no hope for you. 1942, the Japanese invaded the Philippines. 1944, they left. But after the Japanese evacuated the Philippines, a strange series of incidents occurred in the Filipino jungle. <coughs> 30 people were killed. The <coughs> reason is, one Japanese soldier got left behind. And he carried on fighting the war by himself. He was a highly intelligent man. His name was Lieutenant Onoda. He was an officer. <coughs> you know, Japanese orders a fight to the death. There was no surrender. And he carried on fighting the war by himself. On his own, with his gun in the jungle, stalking the enemy and fighting the war. This went on for a long time. It went on for 30 years. 30 years. I've seen a picture. 54 years old. In his uniform with patches. With his gun. 1974. The Japanese, you know, they were getting complaints, the Japanese government. <laughs> <laughs> they sent a major Suzuki into the, Jap into the Filipino, and he found him in his uniform with his gun. He said, oh, no, no, what are you doing? He said, I'm fighting the war. He said to him, J J are you being ridiculous? What are you doing? He said, you're being illogical. Oh, no, said a soldier's duty is not to be logical. A soldier's duty is to do his duty. If every soldier starts thinking logically, what sort of army do you have? I'm being loyal to my task. He said to him, do you know the war's over? He said, I'm not a fool, of course. What are you doing? Completely logical, the war's over. He said, I was given instructions. This is what my orders were, and this is what I'm doing. I'm being loyal to my task. Talk about Emuna. Talk about tenacious. He couldn't convince him to go home. Suzuki went home, Unoda carried on fighting the war. The Japanese high command put their heads together, came up with a plan. They found an elderly officer who had been present during the original Japanese evacuation, they sent him back into the Filipino jungle with the original Japanese demobilization, uh, evacuation order. He called him to attention in the jungle, and he read him the order. On another hand over his gun, he went back to Japan. The Filipinos called him a hero. They bought him a new blue suit. It's a very emotional thing. Thousands of people came to meet him in Tokyo airport. He saw his family for the first time. He left a pre-war Japan, and he came back to a modern industrial Japan and seen his family for 30 years. <laughs> but imagine, here's the problem. Imagine you're standing there in the jungle, and you say, oh, not a, what are you doing? And he says, I'm doing my duty. And you say, you're being illogical. And he says, what does this have to be logic? You're talking this, I'm doing this. What would you say to him? What would you say? So I asked a group of young school children in England this question. And one girl said, he said, she said, he had emona, but he didn't have MS. Right. You need both. You need both. It has to be right. And after it's right, you have to be, it has to be done. But one without the other is ridiculous. You know what you look like if you have this without this? You've got intellect without action? It's like the great British philosopher who taught great moral philosophy. Great ethics. One morning his students found him crawling out of a house of very ill repute. Very disgusting place. 
They said, Professor, you taught us such great moral principles. How can you behave so immorally? He said, why? Does a mathematician have to be a triangle? <laughs> the logic and the knowledge is one thing, but hey, what do I want to do with the other? In Judaism, that's just ridiculous. And what do you look like if you have this without this? Unbelievable attachment to duty with nothing up here? Have you noticed? Unbelievable faith, ready to die at a moment's notice, right, for the faith, but scrambled eggs up here. Very dangerous. Unbelievable readiness to die at a moment's notice with pride. Total attachment. Unbelievably tenacious attachment and commitment to the cause. It's got to be right. And therefore the Torah agenda is the agenda of intellect and character. There's no escaping either. The agenda is intellect, not silly, superstitious emptiness, but rigorous training of wisdom and logic, examination of evidence and history. And then there's a bringing down into action. One doesn't get into guarantee the other. And if you can get that right, if we can get right the, the program, of studying deeply with total commitment, without ulterior motives and vested interests, and then gain the clarity. And after that, bring it down into the real, then we can produce a real birth. Thank you. Mm -hmm.